Stirring family, we are so excited to be with you today. We have an amazing worship experience set aside for you, as well as it is the final message of our series, Discipleship. I believe it's one of the most insightful. <laughs> God, kid, that was good! Stirring family, good morning. We are so excited to be with you today. <laughs> I could just feel it. I could just feel, feel that? it. Yes, I felt it was like the presence of God. Good morning, Stirring family. We are so excited. <laughs> Is that Nate? That's Nate. Mike Cruz, take three. Welcome, Stirring Family. Check the podcast out. No, I didn't. Oh! No. <laughs> I didn't even know what I'm going to say anymore. So give me Come the talking on. points. Give me the talking points. What okay. Are, what what are we hitting? Points. Just tell people to watch YouTube. Welcome. Call to worship. Can you tell me how Just I look? Just do it. You look. Let me see. Set. <clears throat> Welcome, Stirring Family, to the online worship and teaching experience. We are so happy that you are here, and we are so happy that we can reach you in this way. We're going to go into worship. We have amazing worship and an amazing word planned for today. So let me pray as we go into that. God, I pray that you bless every single person that is watching right now in their homes, on their screens, wherever they may be. God, I pray you bless them through their day, bless them through the rest of this week. God, I pray that this service impacts them in a way that they've never been impacted before. Four. <laughs> it's okay, I'll cut it. Just say amen. Just say amen. Just say amen. Just say amen. Just you gotta seal it. Amen. Amen. Yeah, he crushed it. That's perfect. That's perfect right there. All right. Look at that. Oh, 
Hey, Strang fam, I'm Brandon. My wife and I and our kids are new here. As we go into this time of giving, just want to talk to you a little bit about a time when we had a great need as a family. Uh, it was about, gosh, seven years ago. Um, my wife and I had had a business failure and we were struggling just to make ends meet and normal bills come together. And I remember we had tried to buffer our children from hearing and knowing a lot about the experience. And uh, we were talking one night and somehow unbeknownst to us, our oldest two daughters had heard us in the other room just sharing about how we weren't sure how we we're gonna pay the next week's bills and just food and groceries and just the normal things. And um, I went to work the next day and struggled to get through the day just mentally and emotionally and came home and my wife met me at the door and said, hey, the girls have got something for you. And um, Sterling and Elle, our oldest two daughters, brought me this card and um, on there with the card that just basically said, hey, dear daddy, I love you. God bless you from Sterling and I love you from Elle. There was also, my oldest daughter had taken out her, all the money out of her piggy bank. She had five quarters and six pennies, it was $1.31. At the moment, we had thousands of dollars of need, but my daughter took everything she had and just wanted to contribute and bring what she had to kind of help get through the scenario. And I remember just getting wrecked, thinking like, gosh, this is such generosity, and she's so giving and so kind, and at the same time thinking naturally, like this isn't actually gonna change anything in our current circumstance. But without telling her that, we clearly just received the gift and told her how much I was appreciative and how much we were so grateful for it. It was so kind and I thought a lot about my own life, just how there's often times where I don't have a lot to give. I think I don't have a lot to give to the Lord and I'm wondering, well, gosh, there's all these needs and there's all these big things that need to be paid for and what's my little two cents or dollar thirty one gonna do? But as a father, I knew that when my daughter brought what she had, generously, how it moved my heart. And I think the Father is the same way with us. He just wants us to bring what we have. He doesn't ask us to break open our piggy banks and give everything, but He just says, bring what you can. And whenever we do, He takes it and He multiplies it and He does lots of great things with it. A couple of days later, when things had kind of started to recover a bit, I remember going to my girl's room and opening up her piggy bank and stuffing a few dollars in there, which is just as the Father is. He always takes care of us. He always provides and doesn't leave us lacking. So as a time, I'm just gonna go into just a moment of prayer and just thank you, Father, for being such a good dad. Thank you that you always take care of us. Thank you that we can trust you with what little we have and know that you'll take it and make a greater impact than we could imagine. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, so good to be with you again. I'm so grateful for those that have stayed connected during this time. I know it's been months since we've seen some of you. I found myself this week praying and, and just in a time of, of prayer and intercession for those families and those couples that, that I ha haven't actually seen. And uh, we long for the day we can be back together, um, but I'm so glad that we can stay connected in this time, stay submitted to family and God's word and God's presence. Some of you know a couple weeks ago we released a family and finance update online. Please check it out. We want you to see the numbers. We've got some giving goals and we wanna invite you to what Paul calls grow your giving in this season. Paul talks about growing the giving and deciding in your heart what you will give. It's cost us uh, quite a few, oh shoot. That's okay? That's totally okay. Okay, I'll say one of the reasons, and then you can cut there, Kay. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. One of the reasons we are growing our giving in the season is the increase in production costs and film costs to actually produce and host during online. 
So for those of you in our city or in cities around the world that, that are running with us, that consider stirring family, that have found the stirring online to be a lifeline for your soul, please consider giving. Giving generously and what Paul says, giving consistently. Sometimes giving consistently is as or more important than giving generously. And so we just want to ask that you would sow into what we're doing so we can continue to sustain our stirring online and, uh, and grow our reach around the world. I want to pray before uh, I preach this message. So God, I just pray right now, God, that you would stir up just passion for your word, for your narrative. God, that we wouldn't just be people that love worship, but that we would have a renewed love for your word. And God, as we dive into your story, God, would it shape our story? Would it shape our identity, our destiny? And, and uh, we just want to look more like you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you would turn to Acts chapter 2. A few weeks ago, we began a, a series on discipleship. And uh, this is a theme that we preach every year since we planted the church 13 years ago. Um, we had this anthem, we love, we make disciples. And uh, this series of talks on discipleship has been one of my favorites so far. I've been so proud of our teaching team and just the, the revelation, the insight. And uh, maybe because of what's happening in culture, we've recognized the increased need to actually do life on life. Discipleship really is God's plan A for transforming the world. It's the superpower of the local church. We've talked about the gaze of God. We've talked about belonging. We've talked about choosing people. We've talked about discipleship and disappointment. And today I want to give one final word. I want to, I want to talk about the, the, the power, the transforming power of the word of God. That as disciples of Jesus, we are people not just of God's presence, not just uh, of God's people. We're not just a people of, of worship, but we're a people of God's word. And uh, the word of God is one of the most, I believe, forming and transforming and reforming ways that God invites his disciples to be transformed by him. Remember, spiritual formation is the passion of God. That discipleship's not about just behavior modification. It's about spiritually transforming people, forming people into God's image. As Paul talks about contending so that we could be fully formed in the image of God. Or 1 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, we with unveiled faces are beholding God and being transformed into his very image. And so the church, the divine task of the church is not, not to just get people to heaven, but we wanna get people looking like heaven. So we're becoming more and more obsessed with the formation of things, a community that forms people deeply into God's image. And the word of God is one of those ways, one of those gifts God's given us. It's one of the places that heaven meets earth, that we find ourselves formed more and more into the image of God. In Acts chapter two, verse 42, one of the anthems of the church, it says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. So these first disciples of Jesus, remember we've raised a generation of believers when God is raising a generation of disciples. These first disciples, they gave themselves to worship, to prayer, and to community. But not only that, they gave themselves to the teachings of Jesus, to the word of God. Disciples are called to the word. We're not just called to worship. We're not just called to community. We're not just called to prayer, but we're called to the word of God. We're a people of God's word being transformed into the very image of God. Uh, I like to think about the imagery we find in the book of Exodus. Because in Exodus chapter three, 
you've got this, this glimpse, you get this story of Moses. And here's Moses who, called by God, is now about to encounter God. And it says in Exodus 3.1 that one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of God appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go and see it. When the Lord saw Moses come closer, one translation says when the Lord saw Moses turn aside, it was then God called Moses from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, said Moses. Do not come any closer and God begins to encounter Moses and call Moses into his identity and his destiny and his legacy and profoundly intimacy. So here's Moses that, that has this encounter with God. Now, so beautifully, 80 years earlier, God hides Moses in the river while Pharaoh was, was killing babies and there was an onslaught of murder of sons. God hides Moses in the reeds. Then 80 years later, now God isn't hiding Moses. He's hiding for Moses in this bush. It's so profound that it's never too late to turn aside. It's never too late to draw close to the fire of God. And this is what happens. Here's Moses that gets the, the, the fire in the bush. And, and as he turned aside, as he came to draw near to what God was doing, it was then that God knew I have Moses' attention and he begins to call him Moses, Moses. See, we can be in the presence and not actually be present in the presence. We're a people learning not just to be in a room with God, but to draw near to God as Moses did. But I love this imagery here of the burning bush because in the same way that, that God hid himself for Moses in a burning bush, I believe God has hidden himself for our generation in a burning book. Like those disciples in Luke chapter 24, as Jesus opened the scriptures to them on the road to Emmaus, they said, were not our hearts burning within us as Jesus taught the scriptures to us? Now, here's the thing. We know that God isn't reduced to the Bible it's not, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know that the Bible isn't God and that the story of God, the Bible doesn't reduce God, but reveals God. That God is revealed through nature. God is revealed through films. God reveals himself through the Holy Spirit, through community. Um, God's revealed himself through kids. And if you're married through your spouse, can I get an amen? So we know that God's not limited to a book. We know that God can reveal himself in any way he wants, that, that this is not the only revelation of Jesus. But the Bible is one of the most unique, unrivaled, consistent and transforming ways that God reveals himself. In fact, there's a revelation of God. There's a knowing of God that only comes through the word of God. That God hides his heart in his word so that we can hide his word in our hearts. And for me personally, the Bible has been one of those, those burning bushes. I, I remember early on as a 22-year-old follower of Jesus, I had just met Jesus. And I fell in love with the, the, the people of God, community, I fell in love with the presence of God, just God with me. But I also fell in love with the word of God, the story of God, the narrative of God. And, and I remember in those early days devouring this story. I went from being so kind of paralyzed and terrified by the Bible because it was so big and daunting to, 
to diving in. I remember a friend of mine said, read Ephesians. And I didn't even know Ephesians was a book. And so I, I found the, the book of Ephesians and I began to read these six chapters of Ephesians over and over and over again. I, I'm convinced God would rather you dive in and, and entrench yourself in one verse or one book then live paralyzed by all the verses and all the books in the Bible. God would rather you hover over one story and, and really encounter the God of the Bible in a verse or a story or a moment in scripture than, than live with all the excuses that it's just, it's too daunting and, and I could never actually know. And so I lived in Ephesians. I went and bought a, a highlighter at Barnes and Noble and and I began highlighting every verse in the book of Ephesians. Every time that I sensed God speaking to me, every time that, that I found myself in a thin place where heaven meets earth, where I sensed the Spirit of God actually um, leaping off the pages into my heart, every time I would highlight that verse. And, and I read the book of Ephesians so much that the entire book of Ephesians was highlighted, which defeats the purpose of a highlighter. If it's all highlighted, none of it's highlighted. So I went and bought a different color highlighter and uh, eventually I had to get a new Bible. And uh, I want someone to invent the, the highlight version of the Bible. It's this Bible that as you read it, somehow with new technology and Holy Spirit, somehow as you read it, whenever you sense the breath of God on a verse for you, it just highlights. Or maybe as you're reading it, as it highlights, you sense this is something God is speaking to you. I want that Bible. So in those early days, I devoured Ephesians and, and was getting the word in me. And, and at that point, I, I didn't feel called to preach. I wasn't going to the word to get a word. I was going to the word to actually know the living word of God. Like a burning bush, like a, a burning book and, and profoundly what I found is, is when I draw near, it's then that God calls my name. It's then that the Bible becomes so personal that, that these stories written to Moses and these stories written about Esther and, and Daniel and these, these ancient scriptures and letters and poems and, and genealogies come to life here and now for me. As you look at the, the story of Moses, Moses encounters his identity, he encounters his destiny, he encounters his legacy, and he encounters intimacy with God. And um, this is what I've found, that, that as I go to the word of God, I discover my identity. This is who I am. Nothing has formed who I am more than the word of God, the living word of God. As I come to the Bible, I discover my destiny. This is where I'm going. Your identity is who you are. Your destiny is where you're going. And, and there's something so unique and unrivaled about the word of God, the, the, the written, living, active word of God that actually helps us discover our destiny where we're going. I can be reading and encountering God in the story of David and somehow God speaks to my destiny and helps me know where I'm headed. As I come to the word of God, I discover my legacy. Your identity is who you are. Your destiny is where you're going. Your legacy is what you're meant to carry. It's what you carry and what you eventually pass on to sons and daughters. And we get filled with legacy. There's something about the word of God that helps us know what we will carry for God and what we will leave to the next generations. We're not all meant to carry the same thing. And we learn what to pick up and we get filled with that legacy. When I come to the word of God, I discover identity and destiny and legacy, but also intimacy. This is friendship with God. We become friends with God. I'm convinced there's a, a friendship awaiting us in the word of God. In Psalm 19.7, the writer says it like this, your word revives my soul. There's a revival that happens in the word of God. Some of you right now, you're praying for God to rend the heavens and you're wondering where God is in your life and, and yet maybe God is drawing you into a deep face-to-face -face friendship through and in his word. 
And then in uh, one of the most famous verses about the word, 2 Timothy 3.16. We all know John 3.16, but do we know 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses the scriptures to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I call this renovation. The word of God not only revives my soul, but it renovates my soul. It convicts me, it corrects me, it teaches me, it it equips me. We're submitting ourselves to the word of God. This isn't just studying the word of God. We don't just come to the Bible to study God. We come to the Bible to encounter the God who can renovate our souls, who can revive your soul, but also who can renovate your soul if you'll submit yourself to the word of God. I mean, think about how many hours we submit ourselves to the ministry of Netflix, to the ministry of Amazon Prime. I mean, just imagine how many hours, I heard it said years ago that for every 100 hours that that we as a generation absorb worldly or distorted or perverted images of sexuality and life and marriage and culture for every 100 hours that we're submitted to culture's story, we get a one second glimpse of God's story. For every 100 hours that we're taking in the story of culture, we're getting a one second glimpse of the story of God, no wonder why our generation's so confused right now. There's a renovation of the heart that happens when we submit ourselves to the word. We don't come to the word of God to reinforce what we already believe. We come to the word of God to actually discover what God believes, which takes humility to come and go, I submit myself to a living word. Like it says in Hebrews, 4.12 says this, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and marrow, between joint and spirit. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing is hidden before the Lord. The word of God revives our soul, that renovates our soul, Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, the word of God romances our soul. I think at some point I have to teach a message on the revival of the word and renovation of the word and romance of the word. But Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, calls it the sacrament of the word. He, He talks about the sacrament or the place that God encounters us in his word. Bonhoeffer says this, that as the word is read and encountered and preached, that Jesus himself actually shows up in our midst. That the Bible isn't just a walk down memory lane. It's not just talking about what happened or what will happen or the God who was, but that that the incarnational Jesus, the incarnate Jesus actually meets us. He comes alongside And he walks with us, revealing God to us, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, the sacrament of the word, the renovation, the romance, the revival of the word of God. Church, we have no excuses to not know the voice of God. God hides himself not from us, but for us. This beautiful passion as disciples, a renewed, I just feel like, I feel impressed to fan into flames just a renewed passion for the word of God. As I've been praying, I've I felt a divine urgency for such a time as this in a culture of many words that we'd be a people of the word. In a culture of many stories and agendas that we'd actually be a people entrenched in the word of God. Something happens in the word of God that doesn't happen in Netflix. Something happens in God's word that doesn't happen when you're, when you're watching Breaking Bad or whatever show you might be watching. Something happens as we submit ourselves here that this story transforms us from the inside out. 
couple weeks ago on a Monday, I, I woke up and, and felt a bit disheartened, a bit discouraged, and told my wife I, I need to go to a coffee shop and, and open up the Word. I need to go to that place. Uh, I need a revival of my soul, and, and I need an appointment with God and His Word. And so I ended up at this coffee house, and I, I felt led to this, this passage in Ezekiel 37. Of course, Ezekiel. And uh, I was sitting in that coffee house, and I, I began to read Ezekiel 37. And the first verse says this, The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of God to a valley filled with bones. Here's the prophet Ezekiel who comes about 10 years after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Such a tough act to follow. And here he is with the people of God that have been taken captive. They're down by a river living about 100 miles from Babylon. And here they are, some of the most stunning and beautiful prophetic words and, and imagery come from the season of exile. And as Ezekiel seeks the Lord, he gets this encounter where it says the Lord took hold of him. As I was in this coffee house and as I read this passage 26 hundred years later, as I said, the Lord took hold of me. I sensed God's grip again on my life, almost as if God was saying, I've got you. In a season of so much chaos and in a season where it seems at times like exile, the Lord took hold of me. It was so stunning to me that, that Almost 3,000 years later, this encounter that Ezekiel had down by the river, I can have in a coffee house. And I wish you would have been there in the coffee house because in the coffee house, nothing changed at all. But inside of me, everything changed and I had hope again and I could see again. The Lord God took hold of me. So I, I shared this story this past Sunday in our in-person gathering. And when I got to this point in the message, I called this girl out of the crowd and said, hey, would you come up and would you read Ezekiel 37? Let's see what God does as we just read the word of God right now. Could we encounter the God of the Bible? And she comes up and she says, the Lord God took hold of me. And I said, no, 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 read it with passion. And so she reads it with passion. She begins to weep. People around the room, they begin to weep as the presence of God came. And then I said, if you feel the Lord of God, grip your life wherever you're at, just stand. And, and one at a time, people began standing around the room. And after she read a portion of Ezekiel 37, I said, is there someone here who speaks a different language? And some guy from Brazil who speaks Portuguese, he runs up and he begins to read Ezekiel 37 in Portuguese. And as he's reading in such a poetic, beautiful language, people are standing around the room as God is encountering us in his word. I felt like we weren't done yet. And I said, is there anyone else here who speaks another language? And, and some kid, a couple rows in, he raises his hands. He said, I speak Spanish. And, and right after he said, I speak Spanish, some guy, maybe 65-year-old guy, in the back of the room stands up and says, I speak Hebrew. So I have a choice to make right now. And I looked at this, this kid who speaks Spanish, and I said, hey, bro, listen, I love Spanish. I married a Latino, but Hebrew wins. <laughs> And so this guy that speaks Hebrew, he comes up and, and I said, uh, would you read Ezekiel 37 in Hebrew? And he begins to read Ezekiel 37 in Hebrew. We're hearing words like Adonai and Elohim and Ruach, the breath, the spirit of God. And people are standing around the room as this, this scripture reading in Hebrew is happening. And the best moment in that message is when I stop talking and we just begin to read the word of God and God just came and flooded that place. And we encountered the God of the Bible. After he reads Ezekiel 37 in Hebrew, he looks at me, he has this moment, and I had no idea what was happening. He looks at me and says, I understood what I was reading. And I said, well, well of course. I mean, you, you speak Hebrew, apparently. And he said, no, 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 I understood what I was reading. The bones, the, the valley, the, the breath of God, I really understood it. And I said, that's good. He said, no, I really, I understood it. I understood what I was reading. I still don't fully know what he was talking about. But I believe he was encountering God in a deep way. That's the invitation today. 
And I wanna pray for us. I wanna invite you this week to, to find Ezekiel in your Bible. Dust off the pages of, of your word and encounter the God of the Bible. I wanna invite you to read through Ezekiel 37 and just see if God doesn't just take hold of your life. To see if God just doesn't reach through these words and draw you into his worlds. And I wanna pray, God, I pray you would fan into flame a renewed passion for your word. That we'd be a people not just passionate about worship, but your word. Not a people who run to the worship night, but run to the word night. God, a people who have encountered you in your story, God. And I pray right now, wherever they are, that you would grip their lives, God. Meet us right now. Reach into our living rooms through our iPhones, God. And stir up a passion for your word, that we could meet the living word, Jesus. And we just pray this. We pray this in your name. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.